Hello and welcome to our lecture on JavaScript and the browser. So JavaScript is a programming language, but more importantly, it typically runs in the browser. In the browser, there are some special things. If you're just writing Python, right, you've got this whole operating system, whether it's Windows or Mac or Linux, that threads things, that allows you to write a piece of code that says, put out a prompt, wait for some input. When the input comes, write a loop. Make a, make a uh, URL lib request. Wait for that request. When that request comes, open up a database connection. Put that data in the database. And there's this whole thing where you're like, go wait, go wait, go wait. An operating system is taking care of the fact that your, your, your laptop keeps working while this program is waiting. <clears throat> but that's not how it works in JavaScript in the browser. In the JavaScript in the browser, this whole idea of waiting for something is an anathema because it does what's called cooperative multitasking. And so in some ways, JavaScript is not just a programming language, but it's also kind of part of what we think of typically as the operating system. We got to help the browser work with things like document object model being updated, the visible window being scrolled and tabs, multiple tabs are going on, events are happening and timers are happening. And we have much more responsibility in the browser than we do sort of in Python, just running on your laptop. So there's a couple of places that JavaScript can execute. Inline is the documents being parsed. At this point, document parsing stops and then JavaScript runs. You can take over, you can, <laughs> you can throw away all the rest of the document if you want. Or there's some kind of a UI event like a click or something else happening, a resize of a window or a timer can expire, or some asynchronous activity like a uh, retrieval of some data, finishing, and that activates your code. Now the key thing, we talked about this in, in JavaScript, is that first class functions are essential to this execution model because we have to basically say, when this happens, run this code. And the code is data. And so to some degree, we say, set something up, and I'm handing you some code to handle this event. So let's take a look at this 01 noscript.htm. This has no JavaScript, and we've been talking about this all along, where something comes from the server. Here we have a header tag, h1 tag, and a p tag. We parse, the browser parses that response, and then writes the document object model. And so when you do an inspect element, you're actually not seeing the exact text that came from the server. You are seeing the document object model that the browser created as it read that document. And so this whole parse response. And in this particular page, there is no JavaScript. And so the JavaScript sort of is sitting there in your browser, but it's not currently active. Here is a completely different page. And this is the sum total. It's a script tag, document.write, document.write, and a script and a slash script. There is no HTML in this page. And that's because as the document is being parsed, it sees the script tag, and then it runs JavaScript, the code. Document is a predefined object, which is the document object model. Document.write allows you, in JavaScript, to write HTML into the DOM. So we write two lines, the exact same two lines that were in the previous example. And so when that's all said and done, we run the parse response. There's no HTML in this. I've exaggerated this to make the point, of course. We parse the response, we run the JavaScript, and the JavaScript writes the document object model. The DOM belongs to JavaScript. You, when you're writing JavaScript, you own the browser. You are in charge. So if you look at the, the inspector, the source code that came was this script, these four lines of script and document write, document write, and script, slash script. But the document object model, when it's all said and done, is the same as in the previous example. Now, We've been doing this for a while. We've been like making certain tags, like the anchor tag, have an on-click event, and then we call some JavaScript. Now this is my func, open print, close print, semicolon, is some JavaScript, except it's inside of a string, which means it's being executed. It's actually being parsed and executed at the moment that the click happens. And then in the script tag, we create a function called myfunk and just put nice little console.log I was clicked in there. So the way this works is the HTML comes, 
JavaScript doesn't actually run during the parsing except to create the function. There's no other thing. It doesn't actually, the log doesn't come out. But then later when the DOM is shown, there is an event. You can see that there's an event associated with that anchor tag. And that the, if you look at the document object model with inspect, you see, oh, this one has an event. Well, it's kind of obvious this one has an event because the on click is our way of indicating that there's an event. Now, after the page shows up, then you click on the word click me, and then the JavaScript runs. So the JavaScript is from a string. The string is, in a sense, compiled or parsed or whatever you want to say. And then the code runs. And so the onClick event is handed a string of source code. And again, uh, first class function. We've been doing this all along. And if you go back and think about some of the things we used to use, I've been, we've been using onClick for things like um, the cancel key so that we can do things in there. We still, it's just a way to indicate JavaScript. You can call a function or you can just put the JavaScript right there. Sometimes you'll see several lines of JavaScript in an onClick method. Another way to run the code is as the result of a timer. So here we have a page, it's got an H1, it's got a P tag, and it's got some script. And that's all part of the parsing of the response. Now the script basically runs and it says define a function called myfunk that says console log I was called when it's called later and then set timeout my func 5000. What that basically says, set timeout runs immediately and returns immediately. It does not wait. It's not like input in Python. It doesn't wait. It happens instantly. You are registering a handler that's triggered five seconds afterwards. Then we say console log timer started. So if you look at the output, you see that the first thing that happened was that the timer was started. Now, if you ran this, and you can, 04timer.htm, you run it, and then you count five seconds, and then it says, I was called. So this is code that you defined, and you said, I want this to code to run after a delay. And that's one form of an event, a timer expiration event, that causes your code to run. Now, if you take a look at this, first class functions are essential to this, right? And so I've changed this, 05function.htm changes this a little bit. Now notice there is no parenthesis. Now if you put a parenthesis after my func in the set timeout call, it would actually then call my func and the log would happen and then you'd get null back and the set timeout would actually fail. My func is itself, with no parenthesis, is a function reference. And we can see this by adding console log my func to it. So now if you watch the console, you can see the variable myfunk being printed out. And what does it show? It shows a function. Like that's what's in myfunk with no parenthesis. Myfunk with a parenthesis calls myfunk, but myfunk without a parenthesis is the, in this case, parsed source code of the myfunk function. So first class functions are essential to all this eventing. So up next, we'll talk a little bit about the document object model.